We are very honored to have uh, Ahmed Halabi here. He's a campaigner for the rights of young people and was appointed envoy for youth by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in January 2013. Before joining the UN, he has worked with the Arab League, the UN Population Fund, and the NGO Save the Children. He was born in 1984. I was, by the way, born in 1985, which I think makes me the youngest member of this uh, podium. <laughs> Um, I'd also like to introduce Matteo Landi, who works with issues of youth unemployment and entrepreneurship at the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and just took over the chairmanship or chairpersonship of the Internet Agency Network on Youth Development. He was born in 1978. <laughs> <laughs> um, Christina Unterberger is director of the Austrian National Youth Council an independent body representing children and young people in Austria, for those of you who don't know. She was born in 1982, and um, Andreas Schneider, last but not least, is an expert at the Austrian Ministry for Family and Youth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, not, it's not meant discriminatory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On international youth and family policy, he coordinates programs in these areas with, among others, the EU, the Council of Europe, and the UN bodies. He was born in 1974. Sorry, too. <laughs> so, um, after this quick introduction, uh, I would like to uh, start with saying that um, General Secretary Ban Ki moon in 2012 outlined a five year action plan for development with a focus on women and young people. And in early 2013, um, the Secretary General appointed Ahmed al as his envoy to advocate young people and strengthen the role of youth in the UN system. Now, um, the UN system is, of course, very complex, and uh, so it is very important um, that this interagency network develops, implements, and reports on a system wide action plan, which uh, helps facilitate the very important work that we um, right now, the UN and its member countries are working on a successor to the Millennium Development Goals, which you probably all heard about, about mitigating poverty and other ills in the world. So, the target date for those Millennium Development Goals is 2015, after which they will expire. And um, right now, the UN is, um, and its member states, especially, are engaging in a post-2015 discussion on how to shape those new goals uh, for world development. And uh, youth should take an important role in that, I guess we all can agree. So, my first question will go to Ahmed. Um, in your first year in office, you did work on the participation engagement issues, especially. Um, last month, you launched, you launched a crowdsourcing initiative for youth priorities in the post 2015 development agenda. Can you tell us more about your first year in office and priorities for the future? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, uh, it's great to see a uh, uh, student from the University and many colleagues going out with the audience, many familiar faces, many female faces, and uh, uh, also uh, I can't tell how much I'm, uh, I'm proud of the, the relationship that the Prince of Yuan and Austria, in fact, together. We share the same values, we stand for the same values and the same ideas, and I think the UN Charter, the uh, Universal Declaration for Human Rights, uh, are, are exactly the, the reason why the United Nations has been called the United Nations, because it's meant to unite nations uh, based on these values, and we will never be able to unite nations based on these values without having advocates and people who are committed to the Universal Declaration for Human Rights. In fact, I just think that we could now realize that the only document that I don't disagree even with one single word written in it is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Isn't that amazing? It's a human made by the way, document, reached by consensus. I can't disagree with any single word in that document. So this always stand for that, uh, that principle and these, these common and universal values. Well, for your question, I mean, how the year of when I think I still have black hair. <laughs> no, no good year, at least so, so, so far, but uh, uh, the most amazing year of my life so far, 
I mean, uh, coming to, to represent and to work to advocate for the issues of 1.8 billion in person. Half of the world can, uh, citizens are under 25 years old. Uh, usually, if you win half of the votes, you will be elected to, to office and you won, right? We're talking about half of the world's citizens under 25 years old. The issue of youth participation, which you highlighted, is very much the issue of legitimacy for the future we want, or the development agenda we are debating at the post 2015. You can't design anything for the world today without uh, consulting and getting the views of the majority. Half of the world population under 25 years old, they are either children, those, and some youth. It's a must, and it's a game. I mean, including youth in the development debate is a question of legitimacy. You can't have any legitimate framework for development in the post-2015 development agenda without engaging young people. Now, post-2015, MDGs, SDGs, OWG, uh, what else? I mean, all these young journalists. Let me explain it in the most simple terms. What does it mean to have development agenda? We are in Europe. In Europe, you know the term social contract, right? You know social contract. I think one uh, the most revolutionary terms and concepts in the modern history, trying to understand what a social contract means. For me, what this word means today needs a development contract. A development contract that could recognize it's a shame in everyone to accept that in the 21st century, the contribution of women is still debatable whether they deserve to be given a seat or not. It's a shame that 1.5 billion are still living in conflict zones. It's a shame that the most talented generation in the history of Europe is overqualified today and underemployed or not even employed. It's a shame that we are ruining this planet in a way that is not sustainable. And if we continue the consumption as we have it today, we probably will need two planets to accommodate us. The new Secretary General of the United Nations always say, uh, we usually have a plan B, but we don't have a plan B. So we have to figure out how we can live sustainably in this planet. With all these challenges, I keep telling my Arab fellows from Jordan that in the 20th century, many Arab countries have oil. And with that oil, you could boost your economy, you could have a return of the entire state somehow, you could sell the oil, you could make development in nice buildings. Be careful. In the 21st century, you only oil are young people and the human resources we have. But the major difference, if you keep oil under your account, nobody would notice. But you can't keep young people uh, without investments. I have seen them firsthand in Egypt when I was living in Egypt in 2011, when young people took to the street just demanding to be recognized. Two myths that I'm trying to fix today in all my meetings and speeches. First, we are not calling for support to young people. Young people, they don't need support. They need investments. It's about investments, not support. This is not charity exercise. This is not donation for young people. It's about support. I would say it's the most rewarding investments that you can make in your life, and the most pragmatic one as well. The second is about the issue of political participation and participation in general. Many debate whether young people are interested in politics or not. And they said this is a careless generation. They don't care, they just like not really using their right to vote. The fact that young people are interested in politics, but they are not interested in governments. <clears throat> they are not interested in political institutions, political processes. That's why in my Facebook, all what I find are political issues sometimes being debated by young people. And they don't vote. They don't do, I mean, at the election day, they don't join political parties. There's a big mismatch today. Everything became digital, and somehow the political process has remained in the analog era. And we need to revolutionize this. We need to bring it closer to young people. Now, post-2015 development agenda, the debate here is about developing contract for the work we want. The MDGs made a huge improvements at several fronts, I would say. And we have made a huge and significant progress in Africa. Now, what we need for the next 15 years, uh, to make this slogan of the World Bank to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030 possible. And I believe it's possible. The issue of extreme poverty could be tagged and could be solved in 15 years. 
all figures, all numbers. I have the World Bank, by the way, which is the most pessimistic sometimes organization in the world. <laughs> if they are saying that we can do this by 2030, we better believe it. The thing here, the lack of human humans, the Nobel laureate said, we can send extreme poverty to the museum. <laughs> we can maybe disappear from this planet. And just to explain what extreme poverty means, you have to go to one of the museum just to know how people used to live in this. I might sound too idealistic, but again, that's the word map. What I'm calling for today, what I'm trying to say is <coughs> that post-2015 development agenda is about a contract, about bringing everybody on board, about leaving nobody behind. It's not the job of the United Nations, by the way. It's so easy to think, well, this is a development contract where the post-2015 should be addressed by the United Nations or by member states. That's impossible. It's the job of everyone, and everybody has a share in this, should be divided equally. And the reason why I'm calling it contract, not agenda, because it's as any other contract, by the way, defines responsibilities, rules, and guess what? Benefits. We will all benefit from having a very progressive post-2015 development agenda for everyone. So my method today, especially, I mean, for, for the students and the young people who gather here today, Please care about this issue. Please follow what's happening. It's about you. It's not about the agenda. It's not about the UN charter. It's about us. It's about the future we want. If you have access, my biggest problem today that I took the wrong train, my San Antonio. Uh, a train is something not imagined elsewhere in the world. All this transportation, many things that we take them for granted. I can't live 24 hours without internet. And I can't imagine how two-thirds of the world population are still offline. So, there's something should be done, something should be reversed, and I feel it's up to us to make our voice here. And maybe I can fulfill my role now as a human employee, and I'm more a youth employee than a human employee, just in terms of maybe uh, uh, my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Taylor, could speak more about what the UN is doing here, especially when we're gathering here, thanks to Nido for the anti-agency network meeting youth issues. But the UN was what we are trying to do, to do is to push the youth priority at the top of the development agenda. Because at the end, development is about people. If you are not affecting people's life or not making the planet sustainable, everything else is just this feeling. So that's the ultimate indicator for any development policy or program, how much you are contributing to the sustainability of this planet and making the life of people better, easier, and making people reach their true potential. That's the commitment of the UN, and with that, I'll leave it to, to other panelists. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.